I don't know. Craft craft my imagination. <laughs> I've had yeah. When I hear eight acres, I'm like, too much. He has his cough drops, too. My allergies have been really packing up. Right, that's what they're saying. That's part of why I'm wearing a mask, too, is just... I know, I brought my hat on. But... Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> <laughs> We're live Thank whenever you. you're ready. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. I'd like to call uh, our meeting of the Public Health and Human Services Board to order on this Tuesday, May 17th at 8.30 a.m. Um, the first item uh, is the approval of the consent agenda and included in the consent agenda is our meeting agenda. And there is um, one addition I'd like to make that I remembered after five minutes, which is pretty good, uh, <laughs> is the uh, welcome and introduction to, to Rachel Shower, our, our, our new staff member. So I'd, I'd put that um, probably just right after the consent agenda, if, if that's okay with everybody. And then with that amendment to our meeting agenda, I'd entertain a motion uh, for the approval of the consent agenda. I'll make a motion. Thank you, Commissioner Swalson. There's a motion. Is there support? Sullivan supports. Thank you, Commissioner <coughs> Sullivan. Motion support. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. That moves us on to introductions and welcomes. Well, I'm very excited to welcome this morning new social worker, Rachel Schauer. Rachel's joined our adult and home and community-based services team as a care coordinator. Rachel joined us in early May, so she's a few weeks in now, already starting to get connected with clients and really learning quickly. Rachel brings a great deal of experience working with people to PHHS, and we're really glad to have her on board. So welcome, Rachel, and if there's anything you'd like to say, no, Feel I'm free. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Thank you for joining the team, and it's great to meet you in person. All right, and that moves us down to <coughs> the staff report. We have the Children's Mental Health and Case Management Services in Cook County. And um, hello, team. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I felt like we were just here. <laughs> 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 so this might be a little bit of a review, um, but you'll have myself and Cooper today and then Grace here in the back, our supervisor. So uh, <coughs> we, we can kind of have a short slide and then, you know, any questions you guys have at the end, great. Um, yes, yeah, so you got the clicker. I You've got one job, Cooper. I did it. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have it. <laughs> We've even tested it. <laughs> Funny. That's how it always works, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, boy. Hopefully it shouldn't be. Uh, okay. Uh, so the definition of a children's mental health. Um, pretty straightforward here. You know, we all have a quality of mental health. Um, in children, it's kind of seen differently sometimes. We see it more in behaviors um, through different community settings, whether it's in the school, home, community events, sporting events. Um, typically, one, you probably see the kids that have, you know, the outbursts of behaviors. That's kind of more typical. But we're also looking at behaviors that are, you know, more isolated, withdrawn, and and close to. Um, and sometimes there's there's also kids, just like adults, that are walking around that you would never know um, that have internal struggles as well. Next one. Oh, and I, well, going back, to, sorry, you don't have to go backwards. <laughs> but uh, I just I just really appreciate um, talking about what, what that is defined. In the um, Local Mental Health Advisory Council, um, it's a topic of conversation for for like everyday Joe. What is mental health? Mm -hmm. What? How do you define that? And some people really need that, you know, Concrete. book. Yeah, book <coughs> definition. And and others, um, um, maybe who have worked in the field, kind of understand more holistically what it all entails and all the different factors and all that kind of thing. So it's pertinent, I'd say. 
and there's many different tools on how to evaluate, right? On how, how do you determine that? And we, I just want to be clear that I think really one great thing about our agency is we're really flexible. And even if kids don't meet necessarily the criteria or the tools, it doesn't mean that they don't continue to struggle. And so we still offer services because you never know on how much longer those struggles could continue to overflow and then meet a diagnosis of criteria. So we really are open to helping anyone. Um, and there's risk factors contributed to um, what causes mental health. So it's genetics. Um, it's also environmental, peer pressure as kids get older, um, trauma that may happen, whether it's a death, a car accident, abuse. Um, many different factors can lead to emotional distress and mental health, as you can see. Um, and this just, just <coughs> A really short picture of it. Um, one thing that isn't on here is COVID um, that we haven't listed is what has been the impacts of COVID right there. <laughs> um, so one thing we did see um, and I would even say before COVID hit we have seen an increase of mental health in children and need for access to services. Why is that, you know? Um, I think there's a lot of different reasons out there, but uh, it's kind of the world we're living in, too. Everything's on social media, technology, your whole life is out there. There's so many pressures, too, on kids these days. Um, so it, it's hard to be, it's hard to grow up in the world today. It's hard to be, it's hard to grow up. So what do we do? Um... So what we'll do is we have referrals that come in from different entities, community resources such as therapists, schools, um, doctors, clinic, hospital, ER visits. We also have families that come um, for their own self-referral. And the reality is we sit, <clears throat> sit down and figure out what, what is the needs and what is the goals here? What is interfering with kind of just having a normal getting to life? Um, we kind of hash out goals, not only of what the family and parents want to see, but also what does the youth want? What is their own self goals? Um, and then we try and figure out how do we, how do we make those goals happen? Um, so it's a lot of outside of the box thinking. We have really limited resources here, as you guys know. And so it's pulling, <clears throat> it's pulling resources, not only just here, but with availability of telehealth now and things over video, um, it's pulling from all over the state or out of the state. So it's plugging kids into getting primary care for medical, behavioral health, dental health. Maybe they need an occupational therapy assessment or a physical therapy assessment. Um, maybe they've had some ongoing actually medical concerns that haven't been addressed and so they need linkage and help with that. Sometimes families come to us and they don't have any source of income or any um, health insurance. So linking them and getting them set up with those avenues so they can access those services and be able to pay for them. Um, developing a rapport and relationship, of course, with the family. Um, really getting to know them and build that trust is really <coughs> essential um, because that's, that's when you get the honesty um, and the real kind of what's going behind the closed doors or so much underneath, I guess. We use like the iceberg analogy. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that. Iceberg sitting, what you see surface, and then there's a whole pile underneath the water. So that's where we try to be, is underneath the water. Uh, we also do a lot of advocacy and linkage with the school. Um, so kids, obviously, who struggle with mental health, they really struggle in a school setting as well. There's more structure, there's more expectations, there's more stimuli. Um, by stimuli, I mean sounds, people. Um, and so a lot of our youth struggle in the school, so we are up there, Cooper's up there almost three days a week, um, and he can explain a little bit more about his role, but we're in those IEP meetings advocating, linking parents to services, making sure that kids are, yes, they have a 504 plan or accommodations, and, or they need a specialized education evaluation. Um, so we're just kind of monitoring those things as we go. And then, of course, there's also crisis intervention and safety planning. So um, we do develop safety plans with families every time they come. We make sure that they know about after-hours crisis services and what they need to do in case they can't get a hold of anybody. And then we will respond to crises um, sometimes after hours. There's definitely after-hours times that we respond. And then, you know, during the day, we'll meet with kids in their home. We'll go up to the school, 
Sometimes it's in the emergency department. It's just kind of wherever they're at. So, and I think the next slide is, I'll let Cooper talk on this one because he's kind of the lead person on this skills piece that we've been incorporating as well. Um, so working with kids and families, you know, we all have our own histories. A lot of them have mental health things that are related to past traumas or they have different reasons, lots of different reasons for not trusting us or anyone. And that's an uh, you know, appropriately adapted skill for them that helps keep them safe in a lot of their daily lives. Um, and they don't know me, so, and I'm not cool. I don't know yeah. what they know about whoever is popular or anything. So I, I have to spend a lot of time with the kids um, and they're all at school for most of the year. So I try to find, work with their school schedules and find them there in study halls or they, they have different periods of their days that, that they have some availability. I try not to pull them out of math or science or something, but I can go up to the school and spend time with them. Either we take a walk up and down the sidewalk or we go in the woods behind the school or we go to the Y and shoot hoops or I have a craft background so we can make stuff, making a wallet with a kid. I made mittens, you know, lots of just an excuse to spend time with them and talk to them and earn that trust where they're willing to share what's working and what's not working. Um, the skills portion is, we've got a lot of lingo in our world. Um, I use an analogy when I'm talking to a family or a kid who is wondering what that is of like, you've got a head coach, um, which is maybe your, your therapist in this analogy. And I, I'd be more, I'm not a head coach, I'm not a, a therapist. I'm more of like a specialist, like, okay, you've got to go work on this one skill. You've got to work on your blocking. Well, now I'm going to go work with you on blocking football, uh, or you got to work on your shot. You know, whatever sport the kid's into, or whatever. You know, shift the analogy when I'm working with them. Um, and so, if the therapist says you need to work on your emotional regulation, which again is a word that doesn't mean a lot to a lot of kids, I got to help them understand. Well, you know, we got to learn lots of different words for feelings, and how much of those feelings are you feeling? And how do you know how much of those feelings you're feeling? And then. And then what do you do about it? <laughs> it's not doesn't do any good to know you're very, 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 very angry and you're in the middle of math class. Well, now what? So talking with them and figuring out what works for them because you know we're all different and we all have the different ability to to advocate for ourselves in those situations and different supports, uh, whether it's at school or at home. Um, that's how I think about mental health skills, and it, it's a broad. Broad, you know, there's lots of things that you can be skillful or not skillful at. And uh, I'm privileged enough to spend a lot of time with kids that are trying to improve that area of their lives. So. Thanks, Coop. Um, so just kind of some numbers for you guys. Current caseload, um, we got 38 work groups open. Um, I think one thing I always want to caution is 38, that means 38 youth, but literally when we have a family that comes in, it's not just the youth we are looking at, um, it is the whole family unit. Um, so generally we are working with, you know, the parents or the caregiver, whoever that might be, and then if there's other siblings in the home as well. Uh, if we do determine that their needs are kind of more greater than we can provide, then we might link them on um, to another case manager. Otherwise, there's been times that we have case managed, um, you know, caregivers and other youth in the home and kind of helped them to get where they need to go as well. So, um, and then this is just some, um, we asked, uh, I think it was like three youth and two parents, um, just what was case management for them? Um, or what did they think of case management? And so uh, they were able to share, we don't have to, you guys, I don't know if you guys have copies of this on. You can look <laughs> at it yourself. We don't have to go through it if you wanna click it. Um, but it's also nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the state of Minnesota recommends that we have oh. 15 okay. cases a piece as a maximum. Um, 
we are now, thanks to you guys, uh, having two children's mental health case workers, which is different. I'd like to point back to in 2020 when there was only one only little children's mental health <laughs> case worker. We have 30 <laughs> cases. So um, she's amazing. She did amazing. She's leaving us. We're very sad. And the children's mental health came about that. I'm very sad about that. Um, and um, we are looking for a new worker. Uh, but I wanted to say that having a number closer to 15 than 30 allows us to actually spend the time with the kids, spend the time talking to mom or dad or grandma and figure out how can we actually help. We can have 30 work groups that we check boxes on and fill out paperwork and there is a lot of paperwork. But having less cases and having two case managers, having more resources makes a really qualitative difference in the, uh, the quality qualitative difference in the quality of services. It's better. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I mean, it's really working upstream, right? When we're, when we're addressing the needs of children, the idea is that <coughs> we're helping children, which will help them be um, healthier adults, which will have a healthier impact on our community. Um, it just um, makes a whole lot of sense, and yeah, 30 for one person, and the state recommendation is 15. That's uh, alarming, and then still with two, we're still well above that um, recommendation, and so that alarms me as well. But thank you for for all your work mm -hmm. that you've done, and and yeah, we are also sad to lose you on that team, but very happy to keep have you in another team. Yeah. Okay. yeah. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> Not getting rid of me that fast. Um, yeah, but I, I think that also just speaks to what I had said earlier is that we're really seeing an increase in mental mm -hmm. health and identification of it um, with kids. And I just anticipate it to keep going, going up and up and up. So um, I really don't see that flatlining or, or decreasing, if anything. Um, you know, I feel like there's many times that we, we do consulting too. We, we kind of get pulled to the side and, and kind of asked about like the situation or how to handle this. Um, so there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of areas out there. Um, yeah. And Jade, if you wouldn't mind reading the testimonials that you were able to gather, I think that would be really powerful <laughs> for anyone who's watching the live stream and doesn't have access oh, to the visual. I can. Thank yes. you. Um, so how did CMH case management services help people in Cook County? I think it's just helped me get through life and you guys have always been here for me and I appreciate that and I am super happy just to be working with you guys and I always feel safe talking to you guys about stuff and can always come to you if I need anything. Um, so this youth is 15 years old. They have been receiving services for about two years here. So. It's going to be hard. <laughs> it's emotional to hear these. Um, the next one is a parent of a former client. Um, our experience with our Cook County case manager was outstanding. Our questions were always attempted to be answered if they were not able to be directly answered. Two counties were involved. We were given the proper direction we were believed and that speaking just for myself was a game changer and restored my faith back in the system, at least here in Cook County. Uh, I'm going to swear in this next one, so I apologize. <laughs> 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 Verbatim, right? <clears throat> Working with you has helped me in multiple ways in different times of my life, and I am very appreciative <clears throat> of that. Also, you have made it easier to trust some authority figures more, and you have helped me and my mom get into a better spot in our relationship better than we used to be. You have made me more motivated to accomplish certain goals in life. Also, I wouldn't have made it this far without you. You care and understand all the shit I've been through. Should have never happened, but you know that it has made me stronger to survive out here. Even though I'm out here and not where I should be, you should still keep our trust and make me comfortable and safe to talk to you still, and that's a good thing. I have the most respect for you and will miss having you as my worker, but I won't at the same time because I gotta move on, you know? That's my favorite part. So thank you for being the best one yet. 
And the last one, case management to me was like a good version of therapy. It didn't overwhelm me with the thought of needing someone to talk to like therapy, but it gave me someone to talk to when I needed it the most. Um, and we do work with youth above the age of 18. I do want to say that. Um, just because they turn 18 doesn't necessarily mean we're like, all right, off to the adult services. If they have a relationship with us um, and they are still interested in receiving some sort of support, we generally offer that so we can keep working with them and meeting goals. And I do have a couple adults on my caseload actually that have transitioned over to turning 18, 19, 20 now, um, and I still work with them. So it makes a difference, um, clearly. And uh, there's a lot more testimonies we could get, I'm sure, but it's not just. The families, it makes a difference. It makes a difference for us, too. Um, it's rewarding. I tell Cooper every day, there's, you always learn something new. Every day. It's not a boring job. <laughs> um, there's always something that you learn and grow from. And I think, honestly, the connections that you make is the most powerful and one of the most probably special things that I came away with this job is the relationships that I developed with these families and the youth. Um, and I am really terribly going to miss that, <laughs> very much. I'm not going to cry. <laughs> I just, if it's OK, I'd just like to comment. I want to thank Jaden Cooper for all the work they do. But also, again, just looking at that circle of um, where we're going, um, I, I think there was a comment that sometimes it's hard to know what to mental health, what does mental health development look like? I think we're pretty clear with physical milestones, like did my baby crawl? Did they start talking? Can they feed themselves? You know, there's very concrete things that we can see, mm -hmm. but mental health development has um, broad range uh, and is often under the surface. And so we um, depend a lot on the many, many, many years of research on what appropriate developmental <coughs> milestones are. Um, cognition, moral development, understanding right from wrong, um, uh, just the ability to discern and think, also that we can support youth to grow to be healthy, competent, contributing members of society. And um, I think Cooper made a really good point about how um, important it is to help people along that line. Um, sometimes the adults that are in that youth's life aren't the people that they can trust. They are distracted by their own pain, their own loss, their own suffering, their own whatever. And so we can be that person who can help that youth become that healthy, contributing member of society who holds a job, who pays taxes, who, be, who then becomes your nurse at the clinic or you know that fixes your <coughs> car or the next social worker. So that's our role. We're a substitute parent sometimes, not that deeply involved, but we're, we're, we're we're part of that team to help that youth grow. And again, it's sometimes hard to see those developmental stages, the mental health developmental stages, as compared to the physical developmental stages that we see. But we depend and rely on the research and study that has been done for 100 years on developmental mm -hmm. psychology. And Melissa and um, Anna can really um, be our testimony for that as well. They've studied and are studying further um, adult psychological development. Melissa used the term a couple months ago, um, trauma age. Sometimes when somebody has a significant trauma early in their life, that is where their development stops. And so knowing about developmental stages is fundamental for the work that we do with the entire behavioral health team. So I just again want to thank um, Cooper for stepping up and, and everything that Jade has done. And I appreciate you all for listening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, do we have questions? Commissioner Sullivan. I just want to thank both Jade and Cooper for the tremendous job that they do. Um, having had an opportunity to work with them in the schools, and I've seen from the inside the kind of powerful impact you've had with youth and families, and I just want to thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Sullivan. Any other comments or questions? Mr. Hawkins, please. Yeah, so you, thank you. I really appreciate when you do this. Yeah. Um, you mentioned you have a couple that have kind of aged out, but mm -hmm. you're still seeing those people. How will that 
transition when um, there's a new person in your role? Good question. Um, so some are graduating this year, and so they're going to be leaving. So you know they're still they're 18. Um, so they're going to be leaving the county. So we'll get to close them, um, and then others we've linked to um, adult. Will, they will be linked to adult services. Um, so we will be using adult <coughs> mental health. And so we're really, um, we do hand warm off. Warm off. So, you know, Anna warm will be my, what did I say? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, mo some of my um, clients will be going to Anna and her and I will be meeting with them and making sure that they're comfortable and, and ready to go um, when that transition does happen. So. So have you informed your clients now that everybody knows? Everybody knows. Be prepared. Yeah, okay. everybody knows. Um, and we're, we're in the middle of interviews right now and we're putting plans together um, for coverage. And yeah, yeah, everyone, it's, it's getting here fast. <laughs> At first it was two months away and now we're down to less than a month. So um, yeah, but I, I think we'll, we got a good plan setting forth um, with everyone. And, yep. And I'm right down the hall, too. That's what I said. I'm right down the hall, so I'm not going to be far. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and that, I really appreciate you talking about working in the schools, too, and, um, and working with uh, the IEPs. Um, and I, I have a little bit, I have limited experience with the school system and and IEPs and it you know it, it strikes me often that and I, I'm assuming it's similar with case management that just depending on the workload it's usually it's often the extremes that kind of um, that are that are um, needing the most attention um, but everybody, all students, need some kind of support for mental health. All people do. And it's just that we're just really trying to catch, catch those extremes and, and how important that is and how it affects everybody, our whole community as well. Um, if you have a really, really angry kid in math class and there's an outburst or an incident, that affects the whole class. And it kind of can create trauma for the whole class to some extent and so that trauma has a ripple effect much like um, you know the positive things can have a ripple effect as well you know the more we can do to support people who need that support the better off you know everyone around them is going to be as well so um, you know because of our limited resources we we are uh, you know only able to maybe catch those extremes and not support as many as often as, as we could. Um, but I think that it's still a significant impact and I just really appreciate your work. Um, I, the more I learn in this role, the more I truly believe that our focus should be on children and the early years and just, you know, that upstream preventative uh, measures. Um, and I'll just, uh, to, your, to your point of the cases are growing, I think a, a potential solution to that is to put more reses, resources early on to, to try to stop that growth. <laughs> but, um, but you know, there's only so much we can do too. So there's we do what we can. Yes, yes. <laughs> we do what we can. But you are on. You're right on the money there. That early intervention key is so important. Um, you know, and it, it's true, usually, I mean, I think we would like to be focused more on the early childhood, you know, earlier years, elementary, because that's where it starts, right? Um, and the reality is, is, you know, everyone is so, we're playing catch up and we're getting kids when they're already in high school or they're already in middle school. And already then it's, I don't want to say it's too late, but it's a lot harder and it's a lot more work for the kid for the family and, and for us, you know, and that's okay and we'll take it and that's what we're used to, but <coughs> really getting in those earlier years is gonna make the most impact, I would agree. So the, the school district has, um, is continuing to and has recently made some pretty big improvements in their early childhood offerings uh, as well as the clinic two of the therapists at the clinic have specific training for early childhood um, therapy 
which is something we, we haven't really had in our community. So those resources are happening in uh, every one of the teachers at the school. While it might not be a specific job um, duty, deals with children's mental health every day in their classroom, and many of them do it very skillfully. And they are some of our biggest resources. They're certainly some of their kids, the kids, the kids in their classrooms' biggest resources. They get to spend all day, five days a week with those kids. I get them for little chunks of time, and try to make little nudges in the right direction. But as and and then even more so, the parents. They are really doing. As we as a society become more open to talking about mental health, have a better facility with language around that, we are going to see more cases, because, and we will start to catch them earlier and earlier, and that is happening. Um, we as county social workers are in some way bureaucrats and help people navigate <coughs> bureaucratic systems. We try to help that um, boundary between families, organic people, systems, and paperwork, and state phone numbers, and waiting on hold for God knows how long, or whatever, and making sure that they get through the services that they need. Um, and yes, we do work with specifically one end of the bell curve, where people are kind of off their um, where their mental health is affecting the, their quality of life. Um, but we are fortunate to work with a lot of really good partners. So the community is moving in the right direction on that. Yeah, the, 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 the teacher's role is something that came up in the Children's Mental Health Summit, how significant teachers are in kids' lives. and. I mean, they do get training, um, some training on mental health, but the, the more awareness teachers can have to skills, um, the, the better off everyone will be too. So that was, that was a really interesting facet of things. But it sounds like there's really good partnership going on um, mm -hmm. here, and we'll, we'll grow on that. Mm -hmm. Administrator Yorkie. <coughs> yeah, Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, Grace, something that you said really struck me, which is that in physical development, there are milestones, right? I mean, when baby first crawls, first walks, says a first word, I mean, you can quantify that. With, with mental health coaching, um, that is much harder to do. It's much harder to measure progress. And your success comes when somebody doesn't do something, right? when they don't act out in class, when they don't, as an adult, um, beat their child because they've learned better coping mechanisms. That is hugely valuable, and it's very difficult, if not impossible, to quantify. And, you know, as, as a public servant, somebody who has, um, you know, overseen programs and has always worked to um, demonstrate the value of programs through data, um, this is one of those things where it's just really hard to do that. But it's also clear that it's vitally important that we make investments in assisting people in becoming mentally healthier. And I'm grateful that this board has um, allocated resources for us to have two uh, child social workers. Um, th that investment pays off many times over. I know it does. Um, we may not have the numbers to, to support it, um, but you know it does. And these testimonials, I mean, there it is. So, sometimes kids just need to be heard, you know? There's value in that, let alone just having an adult who can coach them in uh, adopting better strategies for reacting to stressful situations. Um, so I just, I'm really grateful for the work that you guys do. It has a huge impact, I know it does. And, uh, you know, if you weren't doing this, our community would be uh, much worse off. So thank you. Thank you, Minister Yorkie. <coughs> Any other questions, comments? All right. Well, thank you both for, or all three, Grace, you, you as well. Or thank you, everyone, for your <laughs> for your work and and the presentation. Um, thank you. <coughs> There we go.
yeah. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Cooper. I think I put it on the right thing. Thank you, Cooper. You did. Thank you. And that'll move us down to the director's report, item four, Allison. Okay. I'll start off with an update on our COVID-19 situation locally. Our cumulative case count is now at 967. In Cook County, it was at 850 at last month's PHHS board meeting on 419, so up roughly 117 cases in the last month. The number of deaths due to COVID-19 in Cook County remains at four, with no new deaths reported in the last month. This week, the United States surpassed one million deaths due to COVID-19. Since the pandemic began in 2021, COVID-19 was the third leading cause of death in the United States, accounting for 13% of all deaths in the country. Uh, the rise in cases statewide is largely due to an increase in the sub-Omicron BA2 variant activity throughout the state. Statewide, there has been an increase in hospitalized cases this past month, but there has not been an increase in ICU admissions due to COVID-19. The COVID-19 level in Cook County using the CDC's county level tracker is at medium. This tool uses a combination of the seven-day case rate for the county, as well as regional data measuring the COVID-19 burden on the hospital system by looking at both new hospital admissions and the percentage of beds used for COVID-19. Uh, in vaccination, we have one additional event scheduled at the community center for this May 26th. Starting in June, we will work to transition those events back to the Sawtooth Mountain Clinic. Our public health team will continue to support COVID-19 vaccination efforts in collaboration with Sawtooth Mountain Clinic by supporting targeted outreach and communications to encourage community members to stay up to date with their vaccinations. While 86.4% of, of Cook County residents have received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine, only 61.5% are considered up to date. Uh, increasing the number of people up to date will be a major public health initiative for our staff. While even having just one dose of the vaccine offers some protection against the virus, uh, staying up to date maximizes that protection against severe illness and death. <coughs> we are expecting the FDA to meet sometime in June to review pediatric vaccination data for six month to five year old children uh, submitted by both Moderna and Pfizer. No meeting dates have been set, but the FDA will meet in June to talk about developing long-term vaccination strategies for COVID-19 that also take into account waning immunity and additional variants. Uh, locally, our public health team remains extremely busy in providing isolation and quarantine guidance to people who have tested positive, as well as those who have been exposed to COVID-19. We continue to have phone-based conversations and to offer email follow-up in order to increase compliance with isolation guidance and to connect people with the local clinic and hospital so that they have the opportunity to talk to medical staff about testing, um, sorry, about treatment options. Uh, and those treatments that we have available are monoclonal antibodies and antiviral medications. Uh, this is part of what the federal government has promoted as the test-to-treat approach, which has the goal of reducing severe outcomes due to COVID-19. This approach is important because treatments are only effective if an individual pursues them early on in the course of their illness. Uh, the public health team this week is attending the Under One Roof Emergency Preparedness and Response meeting in Duluth, and that's today and tomorrow. There's a focus on developing foundational preparedness and response skills, as well as moving into the recovery phase of the pandemic. Weekly testing at ISD 166 will continue through the school year with the potential for that weekly testing at the community center to continue as an option through the summer months. That's something we're exploring. Any questions on the COVID-19 update before I move on to staff updates? Um. Yes. Uh, I, I don't have a question. I just thought it was w a thought came to mind. And I just thought it was worth sharing. Um, you know, there's still uh, a, a good amount of um, debate about uh, 
the efforts that um, have been uh, given towards COVID-19 <coughs> and, and that that sort of thing, um, vaccine skepticism, all that. And, um, you know, I, I listen to, to people's concerns and, and that conversation and, and want to address it. And sometimes it can be hard about how much how much attention to give it or how to address it or are you giving fuel to the fire and, and that kind of thing um and going down rabbit holes can can be can be tricky too uh in in some of those conversations um that i've had <clears throat> the 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 total number of deaths sometimes comes up and and people will say well if you die and you have covid 19 it's always recorded that it is because of COVID-19. And, you know, I don't know how much of that is true necessarily, but one thing that I've done is looked at just the total deaths in the United States over, <clears throat> you know, the last three years or whatever. Um, and you can see the stark difference pre-COVID and post-COVID. And so whatever you attribute that to, there are a million more deaths than that then were expected before and, and that's just a point that i wanted to bring up that kind of helped me you know we can really get into some of the details and that can some sometimes get us off track but having that that bigger picture i think is important um just to to have that understanding so hopefully i didn't stir a pot too much there but <coughs> just just wanted to share thoughts administrator yorkie yeah, one thing I wanted to note is I've noticed in the last month, you know, we've had 117 new cases, um, but being out and about here in town, I haven't really seen a lot of people masking. And I, I typically have not been masking myself. I'm wearing one today because of my allergies. Um, but, you know, I feel like there's, there's a sense among folks that this is here. Um, you know, we might get it. A lot of people, I mean, the majority of folks in our county are vaccinated um, and I think people have kind of shifted their mindset a little bit at least based on what I've observed mm -hmm. um, and have developed sort of a higher comfort level with the idea that this virus is out there and I don't know if that's good or bad I know we're all exhausted mm -hmm. we're all tired <laughs> of being in a pandemic and all the all the um, constraints that that places on the way we live um, but you know I I don't know. I feel like uh, most people are just kind of getting along and, and living with it. And again, I mean, I think there are, there are good aspects and bad aspects of that, but mm -hmm. that's, that's what I've been seeing. It's just really interesting because I've been thinking recently as I've been out in public, gosh, you know, there's a lot of spread going on right now. I probably should be wearing a mask, but I haven't always done it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I feel like we're really leaning or I am. <laughs> Uh, leaning on the vaccines mm -hmm. um it may not prevent infection i mean it, it helps prevent infection but it may not 100 percent prevent infection but it mm -hmm. does help prevent the severe case and so i think people are really leaning on that as well and um yeah it is an interesting dynamic though i yeah i still carry masks around with me mm -hmm. and uh and we'll still wear them in in stores um but not always um mm -hmm. but yeah i'm finding my comfort level is in flux as well same with my kids at school um mm -hmm. which schools are a whole nother uh petri di dish there so yeah. Rana. well at the same time i know of two people recently who were traveling and just took a routine test when they got back and turned out to be positive much to their surprise mm -hmm. so that's mm -hmm. another issue that i think right. people are maybe wake at least in that group waking mm -hmm. up to like hey you know this is you know because then they have to stay home and mm -hmm. for however long and what they're supposed to be doing they're not doing and you know it's very you know, disruptive families yeah. and you know so it's still yep i think people are still and just seeing the numbers right you know? i'm i tend to wear a mask most of the time too yeah for my own and it's frustrating too because we were hoping to get you know out and about <laughs> yeah snowstorm's gone and now <laughs> the flooding and more COVID. it's just like ah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah free of that it, it is so it's so interesting how our community has i mean if, if, we, if we look back think about when we got that first case in cook mm -hmm. county mm -hmm. how we all felt uh, how we reacted the precautions that we were taking before that even and now 30 cases in the last week and you know 
going about our business. But that's why I say I feel like there's a lot of leaning on the vaccine because of that less in the severity. But it's still it's still out there and it's still a million people is um it's very significant. We haven't even started the height of the tourist season with people coming into the community yeah. as much as they will be through the summer. Yeah. <coughs> So efforts continue, thank you. This might be a good uh, time to reflect back on the questions that came up at last board meeting as well about our routine testing program at the school. Yeah. I did send a note out to the board, but if any members of the public are listening in and wondering um, that lingering question, Commissioner Hawkins had asked how many are testing and how many positives are we identifying through that uh, routine testing partnership with the school. So from mid-January when the program started through the first week in May when we last pulled the data, 382 tests were conducted. It's a weekly average of 25 per week, uh, and during that time, nine asymptomatic positive cases were identified through mm -hmm. uh, routine testing. The trends in positive cases closely mirror what we're seeing locally with more cases in January, quite a lull. Uh, during uh, the spring and then more cases again in late April. So we uh, identified four positive cases just at the end of April. Mm. Um, and again, that is having a major impact on people who otherwise would have been exposed to the virus unknowingly because they did not have symptoms and were at school. <coughs> uh, likewise, Commissioner Mills asked about local test water, t local wastewater testing mm -hmm. capabilities, and our staff did follow up with the Minnesota Department of Health to learn more about what it would look like to become a testing site. There would be uh, uh, quite a bit of coordination and some cost involved, so at this point we'll just continue to monitor what's happening in the Northeast region in general, but have the option to look into that as well. Yeah, in a small community, it, yeah. Sure, well, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. <laughs> right, I was wondering what we'd actually have to gain by doing right, that. Right, right, yeah. One, one other interesting thing in just in the last few weeks um, is just how my family has, uh, we've always been careful just with my, my son's um, lung health, asthma, and, and whatnot, but um, uh, we, we all got sick, and it was not COVID, and, um, but it really... It's interesting how it's changed our COVID has changed our response to just a, a normal illness now, um, both with paranoia uh, as well as um, just just you know good healthy precautions too, and and more or less a voluntary quarantine just because we don't want people to go through what we've went through. Um, and it, it was impressive, um, the different effects it had in different members of the family, just uh, really, really interesting. And then where that plays into the last year with, you know, we didn't get sick at all the previous year because we were so cautious. And yeah, it's just really interesting dynamic, this whole thing. So. <coughs> I go on. <laughs> I'll move us on to staff updates. We have five vacancies in the department right now in various stages of recruitment. Very excited to be bringing Abby Banusa on board on June 1st. Abby was hired into our mental health worker position. Abby has been working with us uh, in a temporary capacity on our public health team, doing contact tracing, research, developing education tools. So she's familiar with our, our team and really excited to have her on board in this permanent position. We have had to repost the mental health crisis worker position a third time due to lack of candidates. Um, do you think, I'm sorry, do you think that has to do with the temporary nature of it or just the difficult nature of it or hard, hard to tell? It's hard to tell. Yeah. I haven't. Um, I, I asked that of, of Leah to see if anyone's been contacting her with questions or concerns about the position and she wasn't able to cite any specific reasons. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I imagine a combination of factors, sure. <coughs> um, but we'll, we'll keep pressing on and continuing to expand our recruitment reach on that. Uh, we have also had to repost our eligibility worker position uh, due to lack of candidates. Uh, we did have uh, a rather large pool for our, our executive administrative assistant position and have been conducting interviews for that position. Uh, we've also uh, been interviewing and have reposted our children's mental health case manager position backfilling Jade's vacancy. 
uh, our temporary contract with Abby Benusa for that additional 15 hours of public health staff support is expiring at the end of May, so we're preparing to absorb those additional 15 hours as well within our team. Uh, and we'll be posting for the part-time uh, statewide health improvement partnership grant-funded public health educator position as well. Uh, lastly, our uh, behavioral health team and clinical supervisor position that is in development, proposing to reorganize our children and family services team into two distinct teams, one with a focus on child safety, child welfare, licensing, uh, and another with a focus on behavioral health services, including children's mental health, adult mental health, substance use disorder, and co-occurring disorders. Uh, that uh, job description is in draft form and going through personnel committee to, to be reviewed. Any questions on my staff updates before I move on to department updates? None here. Uh, another note and follow-up to last month's meeting is I connected with Dan Plinsky, who is the supervisor of child support services out of Carleton County, and confirmed that he is available to come to a future meeting and present on program information, updates on caseload trends. Uh, so he will be joining us in September. Uh, Department-wise, it's been a busy month for our public health team with the increase in cases locally. It's a very busy month for SHIP. I want to give a big shout out to Andrea Orest, who's been working very hard to maintain programming um, in the SHIP program during the transition of that, how that is staffed. Uh, our staff will be going through healthy housing training in June to be able to offer that service to Cook County residents. That's a competitive grant that we applied for through the Community Health Board to conduct home-based uh, health assessments for local residents. So we're starting to conduct some outreach and the staff will be going through training in June on that program. And a reminder that our public health team will be coming before this board next month to give an update on what their workload will look like as we hopefully transition from full-blown response mode into our recovery phase of the pandemic. A legislative update, we're in the final weeks of session. Yesterday morning, it was announced that the governor and legislative leadership have come to a deal, which includes a billion dollars for health care and human services. Uh, details will be finalized this week with a final deal to be passed by the end of day on Sunday when the legislative session ends. So a lot of details to be worked out, but a tentative agreement and framework in place. Uh, lastly, just want to give an overview of the item for board action before you this morning. Uh, this is a purchase of service agreement for training and consultation support for our new mental health worker, Abby Benusa, as well as Cooper, who provides therapeutic skill services to youth. Um, as stated in the agenda item request, we do not have the supervisory capacity at this time to provide the level of training and consultation support for this service. This is a newer service for our agency to provide historically the Human Development Center and Ascend services provided this community-based skill work in the community, uh, both of those being large organizations with a great deal of history, support, infrastructure, training, clinical staff, administrative staff, and those are all things that we simply do not have. And we have been working to integrate and offer these skills as we pursue certification <coughs> to be able to bill for these services. Um, so as you heard Cooper describe this morning, this is in the school, in the community. Uh, Kristen, uh, who we're proposing to contract with, has worked for many years with Ascend Services, providing these services and supervising these staff. Uh, we're really excited to work with her in this capacity and that she's willing to help provide this level of support for our team. Um, we have had to do this in the past. We have precedents for when we've uh, brought on new staff and haven't had the supervisory capacity or programmatic knowledge to offer the level of training that's needed for these services. This contract was developed using language from previous training and shared supervision agreements that we've had with Carleton County for uh, child support staff as well as economic support staff in the past. Um, let's see, lastly, we have funds designated for staff training that we'll use to support the cost of this purchase of service agreement. 
so happy to address any questions about that or any of my updates this morning. Commissioner Storley. Thank you. Um, thank you for your report. Could you give a brief description of what healthy households would mean for residents? Yes, yeah, so this is a Minnesota Department of Health funded grant that offers training to our public health staff to go into individuals' homes if requested and conduct a health assessment. So that might be looking at smoke detectors or radon testing, well water testing, um, <coughs> access needs, um, health hazards or safety hazards in the home. And the grant also offers support to purchase equipment or supplies for individuals to address those safety concerns within their homes. So the public would request mm -hmm. a visit? Yes. Oh. Anybody? Anybody. It would be a voluntary service. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Certainly we would integrate that well within our, our work that we're doing with individuals and families already. If we're working with a family with safety concerns for their child or for an older adult, mm -hmm. we could help facilitate a referral to this service, mm -hmm. as well as through nice. partners at Care Partners, mm -hmm. Grant Portage Human Services, and other service groups. Okay. I think AOA has similar programs. Um, and some, sometimes they, they'll like work with bathrooms specifically. There can be a lot of hazards um, for slipping and falling. And so handholds and neck bars, you know, that kind of thing too. And I've um, also familiar with, I guess, ramps instead of stairs and, and those types of things to help help uh, the elderly with, with mm -hmm. safe homes. I've also um, heard some services in Grand Portage about um, air quality with, uh, stoves, gas stoves, mm -hmm. or wood stoves, or you know, just mm -hmm. heating systems and that kind of thing. So, other questions for Allison? Is that it for the agency updates? Then are we moving on to items for board action? Then, yeah, just lastly, one more comment on the okay. healthy, healthy housing grant is that access to safe and affordable housing is one of the top priorities of our five-year community health assessment, and this was one area where uh, we felt our agency could make up, move the dial a bit on that. You know, we can't do a lot to affect the, the available housing locally. There's a lot happening within the community in that area right now, but making houses <coughs> safer and healthier for uh, families and individuals in Cook County. Good. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, uh, item five on the agenda, items for board action. 5A is approve the purchase uh, of service agreement with Kristen Hale for training and consultation. And as Alice had mentioned, um, in that summary in the background there, um, uh, provides a, a valuable service to, to members uh, on voluntary basis to members in our community. And, and um, there is funding for that in our budget already for, for training. Um, any questions or concerns or comments about this? Commissioner Hawkins. I just have a, a question. So it's um, the service agreement is for up to 4,000, but then it said 10,000 potentially if it was needed. Mm -hmm. Is there enough in the budget? I was trying to find our training budget <laughs> and just to make sure we're not going to short something else that we're planning on. If we were, if we needed to uh, extend the service agreement beyond that initial three months and anticipate a do not exceed amount of four thousand, we would likely need to pursue other uh, funding options within the department. We do receive grants from the state uh, to support mental health services that we provide and that we contract out to other entities. Uh, it's cleaner accounting wise to use our training budget rather than build the state. So if we did need to extend it and expend funds beyond that $4,000, we would be able to access other grants to do that. I don't believe our training budget would be sufficient. To cover well, that. That's, I was just looking, thinking, oh, I can't find the right item that 10,000 could come out, but mm -hmm. thank you for clarifying. Absolutely. Thank you for asking. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Else, I'd entertain a motion here. Mr. Chair. Not everyone at once. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Sullivan. We'll fight over it. Um, I'd like to move to approve the purchase of the service agreement for training and consultation for the PHHS mental health staff. Thank you. We have a motion. Is there support? Support. Commissioner Swalson. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion here? 
thank you for the, the background, the summary there, and thank you for the questions. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Allison. And uh, that moves us down to the committee reports. First one is the Active Living Steering Committee. Commissioner Smallson. And we did meet, um, mostly focused on updates and preparation for the bike rodeo, which we did hold the bike rodeo despite the uh, threat of rain and things. And so um, had good support for that and appreciated everybody's support to make that happen. That's it. I've heard really good, really good feedback about the bike rodeo. Good. Thank you for your, for your efforts there. Um, next one is AOA. Trying to recall uh, what I can update you on uh, since the last meeting, <coughs> but it's uh, just a COLA discussion was, was there, and there's a significant COLA increase, um, which didn't have as, as much uh, discussion as I expected. It was about 7%, um, and uh, they are... Um, still struggling to fill positions and still struggling to um, navigate uh, COVID and, um, and supply issues with buses. Um, that's, a, that's a real struggle for them. Um, and then also still distributing food. Um, unfortunately, I don't think there was an event up in Cook County. Um, it's been scaled back to kind of the higher population areas, but you know, we always, both Bev and I, give a little plug uh, asking for, for Cook County service if, if that's at all possible. So, um, and then I'd say s struggling as well with Head Start and staffing. Um, it's, it's um, yeah, it's, uh, feels like a whole nother world uh, when I attend those meetings. Um, but it's really good to get those, those perspectives. Um, AHA, um, I don't think I have anything to report since our last meeting. Gave an update last time. Um, <coughs> but just to keep it in the top of everyone's mind, still just waiting on that funding um, uh, formula from, the st from DHS to see how that's all going to pan out. And, you know, the, f the, the loss, lack of funding from uh, the, the Moose Lake kind of compensation is, is still a top of mind there too, but, but it, it's unresolved to my knowledge at this point. Um, and of course, you know, we're in the last week of the legislative session here, so we'll see, we'll see what happens there. Uh, ARC, uh, Commissioner Hawkins. Um, well, I see I have a meeting on Friday in Duluth, but um, last month we basically, things just moving along with the meat processing plant and they are also dealing with some staff retirements, which are going to cause some hiring issues there. They are already anticipating, but not much else to report there. Thank you. That moves us down to Community Health Board. Uh, last month I reported on the large grant from uh, MDH and um, and uh, I can say that now we've, uh, our director Susan has, has worked through the job descriptions for um, that, that manager and then also planner and then we'll be moving on into the communications piece. So things are moving, moving along there. Um, I, I was trying to recall the, the last medical um, the, uh, report, the, just the consultation. I, I, I don't have that at the top of mind, I'm sorry. And that's always my favorite part of the meeting, too, so it's, it's strange <laughs> that, that I can't remember that. Uh, moving on to uh, the local uh, Mental Health Advisory Council. Uh, Rana, do you want to give yes. a report there? We have, um, of course, been talking about staffing needs and things like that. One, one addition recently has been talking about what we as individual community members can do to help with mental health in the community with um, there's a program sponsored by I think Little Brothers of the Poor that's called Coffee Talk where people can sign up to just call people on the phone and chat and break up some of the isolation of COVID or other things and then we're also reading a book called Healing and the last name of the author is Insel and he is a psychiatrist who and interesting talking about this one of his 
big points is that the medical field has come up with so much more in diagnosis and treatment um, plans, effective plans, whereas the mental health community has not. And people, the diagnosis is very difficult and often wrong. The treatments are very difficult and often wrong. And people are just suffering with this. You know, he's a psychiatrist and his daughter had a, a misdiagnosis, you know, and almost died. So it's, it's again talking about, and part of what he's determined to be a real help is community involvement, it's person, place, and purpose, so that if you have something to do and you can do it, you're going to feel better about yourself and preventing isolation and all those things, which is something that everyone can really watch out for and help with. You know, if we in our daily lives come across people who could use a little extra interaction or things like that. And we started with just a few people on our subcommittee reading the book and decided to offer it to the whole group to see if people were interested. And it's on Audible, and it's, it's very interesting. So I think it's, it's helpful to know that we don't just depend on professionals, even if they're in short <coughs> supply, but they're things everybody can do to help people and survive. So I think that was the, one of the main topics we had. And of course, we're going to be missing Sarah, who's moving on, changing positions, and she's done a lot for our, com our committees with the minutes and everything. So I think that's about all. Anything? Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and that book is on my list now. And uh, Jerry Lilja uh, recommended it, mm -hmm. and he said it was his goal that every commissioner read it as uh, well. Right. And I said, well, it's not my first one. I'm still working through The Body Keeps the Score, which is also highly recommended sure. by everyone sure. in the group. <laughs> sure, yeah. But this will be next, and I'll yeah. give a report back. But and uh, it is very recently published, just within the last few months. It's a new, a new book, so it's current information, which I think is great. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, we know so much more. Mm -hmm. now too and uh i haven't i made a rec how'd that work i think i ran out of request slots at the library mm -hmm. to request the audio version but mm -hmm. i'll 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 go down there and request that <laughs> Commissioner okay. Hawkins. so mentioning <coughs> that book i do appreciate that, that was in your um minutes or mm -hmm. agenda yeah. so yeah. that's i heard yeah. about it yeah i couldn't get the book from the library because uh -huh. I thought oh, I should read that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, yeah. he does have some articles out online. Mm -hmm. I think New uh -huh. York Times and Atlantic. I can't remember where I found. So I read his articles oh, and they were very interesting, yeah. give you yeah. a different way to right. think about it, but did make me think COVID has contributed mm -hmm. a lot mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to some of the issues that I know about. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think it's so important we use the hub that we get kids back into school activities. Mm -hmm. He talks about communi community exactly. being so important. Yeah. And we need to remember uh, shutting down it was not healthy for many people. Right. right. Yeah. right exactly. Impacts are huge. Yeah. So, Ren, I didn't get the yeah. name of the book you referred to. It's called Healing. Healing. Oh, Healing. Okay. Yeah. Because um, like, Dave talked about it. Yeah. Um, the body keeps score. Yep, yeah. the body Is keeps the, the score is one, and then no, no, different, different author, and I don't have the author for healing, but it, it's like healing colon our path from mental illness to mental health. Yeah, his last name is Insel, I N S E L. I can't remember his first name. It's Thomas, Thomas Insel, M D, and he okay. um, had a pretty prominent role in the federal government related to mental health. And what's really powerful about that is he provides this historical retrospective of looking back to the Community Mental Health Act of 1963 that Kennedy introduced, one of his last mm -hmm. uh, major uh, bills before his assassination and how we as a country have really failed to enact the dreams and intent mm -hmm. of that mm -hmm. act in providing community mental health services mm -hmm. and that as a result we have more and more people receiving mental health care in jails or living on the streets. Yes. <clears throat> Many people who are institutionalized in state hospitals receiving health care are people who are involved in the criminal justice system and just all the disparities around 
mental health care mm -hmm. and how we failed as a country. It's quite stark. I haven't made it to the promising part of the book yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the first half is really depressing about how many failures there are. And that was a major point was it used to be people were locked up in mental health hospitals and those were closed and everybody was happy and now they're locked up in jail. Mm. And that is a very expensive alternative, mm -hmm. you know, to, and not helpful mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's really a big need that our community, you know, that the world has, or the United States or something. I don't know. It's, it's people are away from us, so we forget about it, but it's a big problem. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Um, uh, next committee is the restorative justice. Commissioner, Ho Commissioner Hawkins. Um, yep, and I see the reports got attached, so that's a couple of cases they're working on, and nothing new to report. Thank you. Um, appreciate the reports being attached. It's very, very nice. Um, Council on Aging, Commissioner Sullivan. Well, we're doing a lot of work in the policy area. They're developing a smoke-free policy and um, adverse weather policy. It was about snow, not floods. Mm -hmm. So we may have to make some additions to that policy as we move forward. Um, they had their um, Minnesota Department of Health inspection and did very well with that and are in the process of updating their operations manual. So very busy uh, group. And the next group, the Emergency Preparedness Committee, we had an opportunity to meet recently and a big part of that was looking at preparation for our wildfire season. Mm -hmm. Even though we're thinking about water right now and floods, um, we know that there's the potential for a lot of fire. And um, they did talk about the plan prescribed burns. Mike Croteau presented and talked about prescribed burns at Baker, Duncan, Blueberry, Northern Lights. Um, and that is in a PowerPoint presentation, which is available. Um, Grace was kind enough to forward that to me, and I've shared it with a number of groups. Um, so that is the update. Thank you. Moves on to Healthcare Planning Committee. Mr. Storley. Um, we did not meet. Okay. So I'll go right into NACO. Thank you. And we did meet. <laughs> so there's always a lot of planning going on, but the main topic that we're all been talking about this morning is mental health. Mm -hmm. And um, so there's several subcommittees to the subcommittee, which I did not volunteer to be on. I just couldn't handle <coughs> one subcommittee. Mm -hmm. But um, we are gonna have on uh, June uh, 2nd uh, a review of what's been going on with that. Um, also, NACO is getting ready for their summer conference. Uh, this year it's out in Colorado, just outside of Denver in the mountains. They always pick really nice places for people to go, um, other than always Washington, D.C. in the, uh, Mar February or March. Um, <clears throat> and I've attended one of the summer um, events. It's very important, too, because that is where you start the uh, discussion to bring forward to the D.C. General Big Conference, which then goes on to our legislature and senators in Washington. Um, but interestingly enough, um, we, um, the 17 resolutions that we passed are going to expire and new resolutions are going to be brought forward and there will be five interims. So what we do is we revise resolutions to, to word it a little bit different. So um, <clears throat> I'll give you an example. Um, to revise the resolution on crisis response to methods, suicide, and support for mental health resources. So um, they're going to review that. Um, and then they're coming up with some new resolutions um, in terms of testing, vaccines, and treatment for uninsured residents for, um, <clears throat> for COVID. Uh, a new resolution will be senior mental health and aging in place. And a uh, new resolution brought forth by three members, <clears throat> resolution on women's re reproductive rights. And then there'll be two new platform languages, and that's just to look at the language of a couple of um, disparities, equity, and responses to uh, um, the uh, crisis in various counties. So this is just going to look at the language. Um, <clears throat> So that's a little update on what they're preparing for. We'll find out 
more in June, but closer to home, I'd like to bring this up. Um, for many years, well, exactly 58 years, there's been a Nobel conference in St. Peter at Gustavus. I've attended a few of them. Um, <clears throat> this year is the mental health equity for young people. And so at this conference, they always bring in not only Nobel Prize winners, but they bring in folks who are part of a um, study from um, University of Minnesota, Northeastern University, England, Harvard, um, USC. So they bring in people who have that background. And I'm bringing this up right now because um, this is an event that's going to be the end of September. It's for two days. They will be streaming it, so there will be opportunity. There is possibly an opportunity for someone to attend it. Um, the registration is $75. St. Peter is a small town. They have two motels, <laughs> and then you go to Mankato, <laughs> which is only a short distance away. So maybe, Allison, you could look that up and see if anybody you know, in your area would like to attend. We could talk about it if anybody here would like to attend, but I think it's really important. Um, it's quite an event. They have um, uh, general seating, but they also have reserved seating to be up closer. They set up a table for the <clears throat> presentation. They have um, quite an event with uh, Gustavus uh, professors walking in with their hats. Um, you have a chance to visit with them at lunch. And then the second evening, no, the first evening, there's a buffet dinner, and you get to mingle with the professors. So it isn't just a dry kind of presentation. And, and uh, you go home that evening at the hotel and think, let's see, we better review everything they talked about. It's very lively and very, very well. Well, for 58 years, they've done this. So, um, you know, maybe we can just talk. You can look it up. We can talk about it in a few weeks. If you decide someone from your department would, would like to go or somebody from us, we can't wait too long for accommodations, even now. So, Thank you for sharing. <clears throat> yeah. That sounds very um, yeah. appropriate and, yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Pertinent. Yeah, that's my report. Thank you. Um, let's see here. Um, <coughs> Northeast Minnesota Office of Job Training. We did meet. Um, interesting conversation about telework. Um, there is someone who is, uh, needs to move to Texas to help a family in the organization who is, I believe, a supervisor. And um, so the director was asking uh, us board members what we thought about telework. And um, uh, I, I was very supportive. Um, but I, I was kind of the only one. They thought that this would not be appropriate. Uh, and and uh, I was just thinking, boy, how are you going to fill that spot? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But there there is customer interaction in the position as well. And so I can see there is need. But I also know there's significant uh, telemeetings with um, clients with, with this Office of Job Training, too. So I just... You know, I thought, and there's a huge, there's a long history with this particular employee. So I thought, what an opportunity to try this out with someone you know and, and trust. And um, didn't sound like it was going to go that way. So that was that was interesting, and just inter interesting hearing the other commissioners' take on it too. Um, um, so we'll see, we'll see how that goes. Um, Commissioner Mills, that, that point is really interesting. I mean, that is a, you're describing a situation where they could well end up in a place where they can't find somebody to fill that job. Yeah. And in that case, are they better or worse off not having given this person the opportunity to do the job remotely? And I'm, I'm not saying the answer is black and white, but I mean, we know from our own experience here, filling positions right now is incredibly challenging. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's like you, you have to be a little more flexible than you used to have to be. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's a d different, different culture. Uh, yeah, it's, I, I really appreciate your, your awareness of that, uh, Administrator Yorkie. <coughs> um, otherwise, we did have a presentation from our regional uh, deed um, representation, and, and that was very um, 
interesting talking about childcare and and just what what is affecting the Northeast Minnesota economy right now and, and child care rose right up to the top there. Also flexibility uh, with with hours as well as uh, the telepresence. So um, nothing real surprising there. And uh, it was funny because as I, I, I told I told him I can't remember his last name. Carson is his first name, but said, well, you know, you can just paint me the general picture. I'm, I'm comfortable general generalities. And he said, I am not. <laughs> he's very, yeah, yeah, he's very data uh, centric, and it was it was great. Uh, so we knew our we knew our roles well. Uh, North Shore Collaborative, uh, we did meet. Um, not a whole lot to report there. Um, it, that's that was the meeting that bumped into um, uh, the, the the comp study classification. Uh, uh, thing that I had to duck out on there, James. But um, got, we we could use more applications for grants. So anyone who has a community partner who might be interested, please please apply there. Um, we did pass a couple there, but there's there's room for more. And then that moves us on to the PHHS Advisory Council. And Bev's not here, but Allison has some notes if you'd, you'd share. Sure, absolutely. And if I may jump back to North Shore Collaborative, oh, yes. just put in a plug for the LOTS program. We'll be offered this summer uh, in person uh, throughout the community, Grand Portage, uh, Grand Marais, Tofty, and Silver Bay in Finland as well. So we'll, we'll be promoting that. Uh, as well as the North Shore Collaborative for families to get free books and have a chance to connect with other families with yeah. their children. Very popular reading program that I've been hearing lots of good feedback for. So thank you for your work on that, too. Absolutely. Can I ask a question yeah. about the North Shore Collaborative and their grants? Mm -hmm. You said there's still money available. Are we reaching out to the organizations that have applied to public health for the community grants to say, Hey, you should go there first. <laughs> there are a number. Yeah, there are a number of. Well, I don't think we've said it quite that way. Oh, okay. but but yes, there <laughs> are there are. Um, and I guess not every partner has applied, but there are a number that have okay. uh, have jumped on that. And the, it's it's tricky also because in the past the North Shore Collaborative runs out. It's mm -hmm. just right now there's that opportunity, and so. It's hard finding that balance of everybody on board looking for money and then nobody and then everybody and it. so right. we're just trying to get more consistency there and we do have good history as well. So, but thank you for that reminder. Yeah, and yeah. I get they're right. going to have to pick and choose most likely. Everybody yeah. does, but yeah. when those applications come before our board, then it's nice to say, "Yep, we w applied here and, and didn't get it," or not just come here. To us first before looking. I just yeah, like look seeing the, the opportunities yeah. Yeah, that yeah. they've already t explored. Yeah. So. That's and an we do approach. ask that in our grant applications yeah. for the public health community funds. To, we ask <coughs> uh, applicants to demonstrate that they've pursued other funding opportunities and, and tell us what's pending or what they've received in terms of other grant sources. And as well, the North Shore Collaborative is very targeted to children's mental health. A number of the organizations that we support through the Public Health Fund support older adults or people throughout the True. age spectrum. Yeah. But I will, I'll make another point. I, and I have reached out to some, but I'll make a more pointed effort to make a plug there. Appreciate that. I can move us on to Public Health and Human yes, Services please. Advisory yep. Council. So we met on May... Third, we welcomed a new member, Julie Wilson, who's the new executive director with Care Partners. So she'll be taking Kay's uh, role on the council. We also welcome two guests to the meeting. HRA Director Jason Hale and HRA Board Chair Mary Somnus joined us to introduce themselves to the council and give an overview of uh, their roles and how they'll be uh, looking at housing and uh, facilitating the introduction for them to uh, some key stakeholders who are involved in health and housing in our community. Uh, we talked about the Coffee Talk program um, that uh, Rana mentioned. Heard provider updates from each of our provider representatives. Um, and we gave an overview of the timeline for our public health fund grant making process for 2023. Uh, based on feedback from the group, we will be moving that timeline up a bit this year in order to provide a more informed budget request for those grants. 
uh, we have asked for the year-end grant reports for 2021 to be returned by the end of this week and our first step will be reviewing those year-end reports uh, as we gear up for the 2023 grant cycle. <coughs> I think that's it. Yeah, one other um, topic that I what, that I brought up was just the the child care topic and just trying to figure out what we can do, what the best mechanism is um, to support that. Um, it really is an economic or well, community development, but it really is also a quantifiable economic development issue. And so I'm starting to lean towards maybe EDA is the best, and, but I haven't had any conversations with Beth about that. But Jason Hale did reach out. He has experience with that uh, as well, and, and I have not yet connected further with him. But it, there's just common mm -hmm. understanding of, of the, the reality, the stark reality and the importance of this um, I, I did. I was able to start trying to gather some numbers just to try to get a handle on what what does this mean if we were able to set up a fund or something, and the numbers ranged. And I need to do a little more deeper dive here, but just so that everyone gets some kind of idea, they range from uh, a subsidy of uh, I think close to a hundred thousand um, dollars, and that would be to each childcare worker would be the subsidy to make those jobs competitive, not $100,000 each. I thought I, thought I, saw, I thought I saw a smoke <laughs> coming out here. <laughs> yeah, no, that's the total. Uh, and then, uh, but then it ranged to, and I'm not comfortable with this number, but it was universal child care for $300,000, which I don't, I don't know enough about how that would work, but I was just fishing for something to give me some framework to work with. So, starting place that range, and um, we'll see, we'll see where we can go, what kind of money we can find, or, um, yeah, I know there's programs out there. So, which brings me to that Blandon opportunity. Um, it sounds like there could be um, some grant opportunity there. Uh, that's significant, um, up to one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Um, so that could be really good seed money or a real good trial or a real good subsidy start, whatever. So um, don't know if we're going to be able to get a letter out in time. Um, but Yeah, the letter of interest is due tomorrow. <coughs> yeah. And um, we need to connect on that. Yeah, I've never written a letter of interest, but uh, if I can help, I would love to. Um, so it Actually, I mean, it shouldn't be that difficult. I mean, Grace threw out some really good ideas. Yes. Yeah. So, and we just need to put some meat on the bones. And well, yeah, and I and I feel like a letter of interest doesn't need real specific meat either, right? It's just a, it's just the idea, mm -hmm. basically. So, if we can make that happen. I think that'd be game changer for us and uh, a no brainer for <coughs> them, hopefully. But mm, I think that was all that I wanted to chime in there on that on that meeting. Just that there's continued talk about about child care. Bring this to oh, go to the order. Anything from anyone? Down to the wire here. Allison. I, of course, have something to add. Um, our meeting to review our last five-year community health assessment oh, yeah. and health improvement plan meeting was moved out to June 15th. So you all should have received an update on that. If you haven't and you'd like an invite, please let me know, and I'm happy to forward that along. So we'll start by reviewing our last five-year plan, look at progress made towards collective goals for health improvement and how we want to move that forward for the next five-year plan. If we could also post that um, <coughs> so that all of us could attend, I think that would be really valuable. Um, and I would really encourage all of us to attend. It, mm -hmm. It's really, really <laughs> crucial to have an involvement there. It's currently noticed on iCompass as a public meeting. Mm -hmm. June 15th? Yes. Mm -hmm. On Zoom. On Zoom? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Any more? Go to the order. Looks like not, so I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. <laughs> Thank you. Is there support? Support. Thank you. We are adjourned. All right. Well, should I shorten?